interview with Fred Barrett is being recorded on April 10th, 2003 at the Lodge of the Ozarks in Branson, Missouri by the Branson Veterans Task Force. It's part of the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress. The interviewer and camera operator is Joe Bryant. Mr. Barrett, would you state for the camera your full name and place and date of birth? I'm Frederick E. Barrett, Jr. Uh, I was born in Worcester, Massachusetts and inducted into the service from there. Uh, I was born in June uh, 10, 1920 and uh, whatever. And what's your current address? I'm now residing at uh, 15 feet 50 Beach Boulevard in uh, Biloxi, Mississippi. Now, you were in World War II and Korea? I was in, yes, I was in World War II and then uh, at the end of Korea. Okay. I got to the end of Korea. Uh, what were you doing before you went into military? Uh, after high school, I got a job in uh, Norton Grinding Company, was, which was a defense plant. And I was in the experimental department and we were developing a new uh, camshaft grinders for the Russian military. Uh, and so I had a deferment at the time. And then I got, it was winter and I got pneumonia and got sick and, and, uh, and when I went to work uh, when I was able and the draft board gave me a telephone call and said, uh, uh, good buddy, uh, if you, uh, if they could do without you for uh, two weeks, they can do without you for two years. So uh, you report the draft board in the morning and uh, they stuck me on a bus and sent me to Camp Devons uh, as, as a private uh, inducted into the war. And that was, I guess, about February of 42. And you took your basic then at Fort Devons? No, 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 I, no. I, I thought it was kind of interesting. They marched us practically nude in a great big cold warehouse and, uh, and, and interviewed us as to our qualifications and uh, so forth. And uh, I told them that I was, uh, had been in machine grinding and was uh, developing grinding machines and, and, and the experience I had. And they said, well, that's just what we need uh, for the ordinance. And I was so pleased. And they said, now if you'll get up and walk out the back door of the warehouse and go down the hill, there's a train down there. So everybody that morning got out, went out the back door and down the hill in the snow, got on the train, and when they blew the whistle, we found out we were all going to Camp Shelby, Mississippi, to the tank destroyer battalion. And so it was kind of a joke. There really was no classification. We all became uh, tank destroyers, and uh, we traveled then all the way to Mississippi, and, and I joined the tank destroyer battalion at Camp Shelby, where I did my basic. And what, what outfit were you with there? I was with the 643rd Tank Destroyer. If you remember, in World War II, uh, there was four, div the divisions were square divisions. There were four divisions, four regiments. And then when the Second War broke out, they decided to make them triangular divisions, and that left a whole brigade excess, and the, a lot of artillery excess. Um, and they were wondering what to do with them. Well, then at the same time, Rommel was overrunning the American tanks in Africa. And some smart general came up with the idea that we needed a special force to deal with Rommel. And uh, looking for bodies, he found these excess artillery brigades uh, that uh, were left over with the reorganization and so they made them tank destroyer battalions and uh, the uh, one I joined was from uh, Iowa it was a National Guard out for Iowa and it went down to Camp Shelby and then we were fillers for that the cadre was a National Guard and we were fillers for the 643rd tank destroyers I took my basic there and 
and uh, and uh, when I completed basic, uh, the uh, lieutenant called me in uh, that had the company commander and told me that uh, he had an opening for tank for an officer at Fort Hood, Texas, for the tank destroyer uh, OCS. So uh, I said, well, I'm only a private. And he said, well, you've got to be an NCO to go there. So if you want to go, I've got a quota. And, uh, and I think you'd make a good officer. So he said, uh, what I'll do is uh, promote you to corporal and stick you on a train and send you to Fort Hood. So this would be about September. I went down to Fort Hood uh, and I was in the ninth class. There was nothing those days at Fort Hood except uh, nine barracks. And eight of them had classes in them. And the ninth barrack was uh, OCS class nine. And there was a small building for a PX and service club. We went to school in Cowhouse Creek Schoolhouse, which uh, in Fort Hood was then, had no roads. They were just dirt and bulldozed. And uh, I went to the ninth class there at uh, Camp Fort Hood. Well, from there, what, where did you go? Well, you got it was vision. kind of a funny little story there, I thought. Uh, we all got our orders in December when we completed school to go to um, to go to our first assignment. And when I read the first assignment, it was to go to the uh, uh, 643rd Stank Tank Destroyer Battalion. Well, now you know that stories about shave tails. Well, here I'd only been in the Army three or four, well with OCS about eight months, seven to eight months. And I was a shave tail and I had a baby face. And uh, I thought, how can I possibly, and that first sergeant didn't love me when he shipped me out. And I thought, how can I go back and face, and so I had to, and I walked in and uh, Lieutenant, I mean, Sergeant Kelly looked at me and he said, well, I'll be darned. He says, well, we're going to make your life miserable. And I believed every word of it. <laughs> so I went down to, General McNair had a command at that time, and I heard he was a pretty good Joe, so I went down to the headquarters building and talked to General, uh, uh, the general down there, and uh, he shipped me to Camp Claiborne, Louisiana's 634th tank destroyer, which I joined and... Uh, went to Europe with the 634th tank destroyer and uh, enjoyed that and uh, we went to England and from England to Normandy and so forth. What was your, uh, as a platoon leader or whatever in the, in the battalion, uh, what did that entail? Well I was a, uh, of course, a platoon lead. I started out as the company executive officer and uh, I was the exec of Company A of the 634th Tank Store Battalion, and we all got went to New York, got on a plane, a, a, a ship, to go to uh, England. And on the ship, uh, the captain got violent, violent headaches, and. Uh, it was really very sad, and he died on the ship going over. And uh, I was kind of hoping I could get the company. We had quite an investigation before we could get off the ship as to what had happened to the captain or why he died, but it changed the thing somewhat. Another lieutenant, a lieutenant uh, uh, from the organization was given the company and I didn't get it so I was a platoon leader I had five tank destroyer uh, units a tank destroyer unit we had uh, M10 tank destroyer tanks they were different from the than the than the uh, infantry tanks or the conventional tank they were open on top they had no turret the turret was would pivot but it was all open on top and so it wasn't the best vehicle in the world for street fighting because things could they could throw projectiles into the tank 
and uh, we, 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 we did our time in, uh, in England getting ready for Normandy. And then we woke up one morning and heard that D-Day had come. That was quite an experience. Uh, I think when you're young, you don't ex you don't understand, uh, and maybe it's just as well that you don't. Yeah. And I got uh, we we were moved then to uh, Southampton and moved by a boat, and we went in to. Uh, to Normandy, uh, I guess, about uh, uh, D plus two, we landed and went ashore, and uh, the first encounter was St. Marie Eglise, uh, where they completely leveled the, the town. There wasn't much left when we got there, but we, 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 we ran into a lot of opposition from the enemy, and uh, we, I can't I keep forgetting the name of the division we joined, but the division uh, wasn't making very good progress, and the uh, and to to breaking out of Normandy, so they relieved the command there and put the first division in. And at that time, we were transferred from them over to the first infantry division, uh, a mighty fine division, and. Uh, one that had come all the way from Africa, Sicily, Italy. So they were well trained and they were, had a lot of esprit de corps. And we were so pleased that we got to be with the first and we went all the way then through the war with the first division. And the way we did it, uh, we had um, three platoons in each company. So then the infantry as three regiments so we have three companies so we put a company with each regiment and each regiment has three battalions so we broke down one platoon so my platoon ended up uh, I was the third platoon of company A of the 634th and we ended up with the uh, third battalion of the 26th infantry Colonel Lieutenant Colonel Carley was commander and we went with him all the way through and our job was to set up roadblocks at night or to penetrate if they had armor, fight armor, or any anything that had to be done where we had to... Uh, what was the main armament on, on one of those tankers? We had a three-inch gun that was a Navy gun. The first tank destroyers that came out were old white trucks with... 75 millimeter guns and they had the 601st tank destroyers took those into Africa and in Catherine Pass they got blown all to you know what uh, because all it was was a big old truck with a roller on front and it got stuck in the sand and the armor was, was quarter inch plate so they came up out of Fort Hood and invented this vehicle which was called an M10 it had it, it had a lot of armor and it had two diesel engines and uh, and they needed a gun then they would they hoped would uh, penetrate uh, M an M6 Tiger tank or at least a German tank so they put this Navy three inch at that time that three inch Navy gun was about the highest velocity gun the Army had available to it and they equipped us with that and we considered it a very excellent weapon. The, uh, the, the M10 tank destroyer had it all over the old uh, Patton tank because those days they put that Pratt & Whitney rotary, rotary engine in and it backfired and banged and banged and threw hot exhaust at night and we had diesels and we could, the only thing you could hear us come in were the tracks squeaking and we, we greased the tracks up and then we could just purr along. We had no backfire, no gas, no, no flame, and we could sneak around pretty good if we could grease our tracks. And uh, they, in fact, in the snow, they couldn't hardly hear us coming. So you went through uh, the war. What, where were you when the war ended? Well, be, before it ended, I. Uh, I thought I might mention uh, the uh, Battle of Aachen because yes. 
Right now, the, uh, there's much interest in the Battle of Baghdad. And it's been very interesting to me because uh, we got involved in Aachen and that was big, big donuts in those days. You know, we went, we broke through the Siegfried Line and we're moving on through and then we got to Aachen. Now, Aachen was going to be the biggest city that, uh, that was going to be defended just like Baghdad. To the end, Hitler said, we're not going to, we're going to, everybody will fight. So we went into a perimeter defense and the first division did and, uh, I remember we were we were in a swamp situation for about four days, and uh, we were being shelled incessantly and trying to. We we had no way to get rations in or get people out that were hurt, and so we were trying to minimize our casualties. And uh, I, I remember there was a brick factory off here to the left. And we finally got the idea that maybe it was, so we blew the top of the brick, the, 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 the chimney off, and that's where the observer was. Uh, a day or two later, they got the name, and it was uh, October 12th, 1944. We got to, to move in that morning where we're going to go into Aachen. So we, we went in, uh, no. And Marby was the 11th. I think the 12th, we were in there and we got a toehold and we slept there that night the best we could. And next morning we started our street attack. And uh, Colonel Corley came to me and said, there's a tank that's holding the whole works up off on the left, up there on that street on the left, and he's firing into us. And every time we try to go through that intersection, uh, he is going to blow our uh, blow us up. So my sights and my tank were on the left of the tank turret, and I thought by the time we got clear of the buildings and got out on to to shoot, they wouldn't be able to. They they they'd hit my tank. So I said, what I want you to do is I'm going to get out on the front of the tank and I'm going to become your eyes and ears. And when I see that tank and you have the gun leveled and, and uh, when you see that tank, um, uh, when I see it, I'm going to haul a fire. And you, I don't care what happens, you keep on firing and you keep firing no matter what happens and we'll... So we did it. We we got moving forward, and I, like a dang fool, got out on the front end. And the next thing I knew, I was kind of dizzy. I I knew I was hit, but I'm screaming to the sergeant, "Keep on firing!" And I jumped back into my tank, and I landed on the floor. And I know I'm screaming, "Keep on firing!" till the sight man could see the other enemy and we got him and moved up into the intersection and uh, that time uh, they got me out of the tank and Colonel Carley came over and he said well my artillery man's been killed do you now direct artillery and I said yes and he said we can't get an ambulance in here we're uh, cut off so he said, while you're waiting for an ambulance, do you think you're able to conduct the artillery barrage that's holding us up? And I said I would, and I did. And then I, uh, about four hours later, they took some bulldozers and they bulldozed the railroad track off of the foundation and got ambulance, ambulances in there. And they got me out. And of course, the story is I, I ended up in Northern England, in Harrogate, England, in the General Hospital. And then uh, I uh, did pretty good. I was pretty happy. I was recovering fine, and I was down in Worcester, uh, England, uh, for Christmas. And I pretty proud that I was having a ball and 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 a, and a girl and, and and good food and everything was great when uh went back to the 
the uh, rehab camp and they said they're looking for you there's been a battle of the bulge has been come in and the first division wants every able-bodied man back there tonight today and so I ended up on a down LST and middle of the winter and ice and snow and had to wait ashore in La Havre and of course it got worse I got on a train that they, they talk about World War One, the 40 and 8s. Well, that's what we rode, a 40 and 8. They loaded a boxcar with all of us officers and started no heat, a box of sea ra uh, rations, and put them in, uh, b b they gave us a case of sea rations, and they put about 30 of us officers in one of those boxcars, freezing weather, and started us off of the front. And I went. I went to the rep of depot and the snow was about six foot deep and uh, they I was the only officer apparently at the moment so they told me that to go down to one of those parambola tents down there and that they'd notify my unit that I was there so I found I found a pot belly stove in that tent and I found some wood and I got warm and I think of that often I, that was the first time I'd been warm in a week or two and I had no more than got warmed up and thawed out then uh, here came the, the colonel's driver with an open sedan remember the old scout car and he says Lieutenant Barrett I'm here to pick you up and get you back they want you to front right now and uh, I thought, oh no, and this is the first time I've been warm. So he got me back up the front at a place I think called Butenbach. And uh, the colonel says, and you, uh, you, you, we had to have you back, but he says, I won't send you up to the front because you've had your share of the war. And I said, well, uh, I, I'm pleased with that. I got two nights sleep and he woke me up and he said Lieutenant uh, so-and-so has been murdered or been shot and somebody's got to take that platoon over so you're gonna have to get up there tonight. I think that was the most scary thing I ever did in my life. You know, uh, I always said um, if you're in combat uh, and you know the situation, you know the maps, you know your men, you know the problem, you, you can tolerate it. But to go in cold, uh, we, we started out on the Jeep that night and the Nebelwerfers, the Nebelwerfers, I don't even know what a Nebelwerfer was, but the Nebelwerfers fired on us. They didn't know we were, who we were, but we were going up through the forest there. And the Nebelwerfers fired they are uh, banks of rockets just like the, they have now. They were banks of Germans had banks of rockets mm -hmm. and so they'd lay a blanket of fire now. I told the driver just keep going it, it, we got to drive out of it. So we got up there and the sergeant told me they'd been losing men and, and, and anyway we I finally found a unit a pitch black night. I don't know how we found anything in the, with no flashlights and uh, I took that platoon over and uh, went from there on up to Roa River all the way to, we kept going to Leroy and then uh, when I got to, uh, we hadn't been getting any sleep, we'd been moving too far and too fast. Uh, the battalion commander came in and he says, well, uh, we, uh, we, one of my uh, companies has been captured and they're prisoners of war over here in the forest. Would you be willing to volunteer to take a task force uh, to try to recapture them? Well, you didn't volunteer. That was a loose term. He, uh, yeah, I volunteered. And so he, I studied the maps and I studied it was a heavy forest area and I got, he gave me a platoon of men I didn't know till afterwards. They were all replacements. But he gave me a platoon of men and we set off about uh, five or six o'clock at night just before dark going through this forest and trying to memorize these 
I got over there and set up my defenses and come morning the Germans attacked us and uh, and we counterattacked. Uh, we had put up our defenses. That's when I, I say found out I had one, one soldier laid in the middle of the street with a machine gun pointing towards the Germans. Well, there was an abutment uh, uh, right beside the road. There was a berm there. I picked him up by the seat of the pants and threw him and I said, get out of the middle of the street. And somebody screams, don't be hard on him, he does, he's scared. I said, yes, yeah, so are we all. So anyway, um, we, we would then, and all of a sudden I saw this uh, American uh, coming across the field. And he was limping and, and crawling. And so I ran out in the middle of that field and I found out it was a, uh, was a lieutenant. And he said, my men are in that barn, that red barn back there, and there's a tank in there. And I guess he helped save our soul because about the time I started then getting a tank destroyer ready to shoot into the, I didn't want to shoot into the barn because the, uh, I knew that the loft was full of our men. And about that time, that tank came out of the barn and he came, we let him get pretty close and then we did, did him out. And uh, that time all of the men started running towards us, all the whole company of infantry practically. And off to our left, we started heavy tank fire and the, uh, the Germans finally just threw their hands in the air and realized they weren't gonna, when the machine guns and tank fire, they, they, they surrendered. And uh, I put them marching in front of us and we loaded all of the people, the tanks, and we started home and uh, we got back to the center and uh, I forgot all about it. Uh, you know how it is, uh, I forgot it, but uh, the um, somebody wrote a silver star for me for that. I got a silver star for that operation. Somebody wrote it up and I'm glad. You know, there was great bravery in the war. Uh, a lot of baby and we'll never know and those men will never they'll be forgotten because people probably don't think about that That's right. but unless somebody and 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 the, the men in the field do not have time to sit down and write a novel about or an essay on the bravery of Billy Jones. And that's what it takes for and, you. And that's the only way you're gonna get a citation, a decoration which is appreciated so much by the families. And that's the only way they get credit. Somebody takes the time to write that up and send it in. And uh, I was pleased, I don't know who did it. Uh, I was aide to a general back, well, actually then the war ended in May and I was in Czechoslovakia with my platoon. And uh, that's a little war story there. The, the uh, colonel called me in, he says, I got a problem. We're being levied for experienced combat fighters for the invasion of Tokyo. And he said, I've got to send an officer back to the States right now to uh, teach invasion tactics and to go to Japan. I said, good golly, Colonel. I landed in Normandy. You've got lieutenants in here that haven't been with us a month. Send them. He said, you can't. The government came up with some stupid s system in those days called points. And you got points for your wife. You got points for all your kids. You got points for more things than you can shake a stick at, and a bachelor didn't have a living chance. You got points for your decorations, but nobody had the decorations in those days. Yeah. So he says, you haven't got enough points. You, you, you have as few points as anybody in the battalion, so I've got to send you back to States. And that, uh, so I went back and uh, was on a 30-day leave, and the bomb, they dropped the bombs, and uh, I was very thankful for that. Mm -hmm. And we went, uh, I was shipped into uh, Fort Swift, Texas then, and I got a job as an aide to a general. And that's, while I was there, I got noticed that I had 
been awarded Bronze Star and Silver Star and so forth. And uh, after that, I don't know, my memory is a little blank. I, uh, I think I, oh, uh, the general retired and he said, you can go any way you want. Well, I had all the tanks I wanted to and I'd been blown out of three of them. So I said, I will go to the artillery. So he sent me to artillery school and when he retired and after I really finished artillery school, sent me up to the second infantry division at Fort Lewis, Washington, and I screwed up royally. And the general, I think, I, I, what I think, I don't know, but the first thing I knew, I had orders to back to Europe. And I, I know where I, what I did to screw up, I think made the general upset with me, but I think he did it to me, but somehow I got your, right back to Europe. Got an 8-inch gun battalion in Europe uh, and was training them and then uh, they wanted officers to go down a secret mission to, uh, they were going to close the Italian theater and uh, they wanted officers to go to the Italian theater and uh, on secret mission and that was quite an interesting story. I went on down anyway down there and uh, I got a job, he interviewed me and told me that I would be issued an automobile and I'd go to Fort, I'd go down to uh, Naples and I would be with CIC on a secret mission and while I was driving out of the compound down at the King's Palace in Caserta, Italy, the MP stopped me and says you wanted back right away to the compound. The general, commanding general of the theater, General Lee, wants to talk to you. So I went back and General Lee says, you can take that car and turn it in and I'm changing your orders. You're going to be one of my aides and you're going to run my compound here and hotels and uh, you're going to be really my entertainment aide. And um, the next day I was went and was in the beautiful gardens in the King's Gardens in Italy and the next and we were living in Parambola tents there and I was with another aide and next day I saw this pretty girl walking through there and I said who's that and they said that's the uh, G1's daughter she just came over here from Cornell University and uh, she graduated and came overseas and she just got here I said I guess I better go meet her and uh, they, the other eight says, well, I think the guy that picked you for that job and signed you for that job is her father. So I got a hunch there's some shenanigans here. Anyway, I ended up and married her. She's waiting in the car outside. I married my wife, a lovely girl, and, and uh, we went back to the States. And of course, that, that's the end of the European uh, conflict. But I've been real interested in some of the goings on at uh, Baghdad. I, I I think about them street fighting and yeah. our street fighting in Aachen, Germany, and and. Uh, well, then you wound up in Korea. Yeah, I was. Uh, I uh, of course kept getting a few promotions here and there, and one thing another, and then. Uh, now, what rank were you when you were in Italy then? Still in first. Italy, I was still a first lieutenant. And I got to meet everybody. I have beautiful pictures. I was so fortunate. I, I remember a wonderful week with the Duke and Duchess of Windsor. Uh, he came into the hotel. I was running one of the big, beautiful hotels called Principe di Piemonte, which, was, uh, which is on the Italian Riviera. And uh, that's where they put up all the visiting dignitaries. And he came in there and he was in great pain. I asked him what was wrong and he said he had something in his eye. And I said, well, hell, my mother says it just spit in the eye. So I took him upstairs and we spit on a handkerchief and I got the thing out of his eye. And he <laughs> says, well, he wanted to go swimming, so I loaned him my swimming pants and my bathrobe, and we came very close with Duke and Duchess, General Clark, General Lee, General Huben. They all were guests there, and I got to, it was a real, I really enjoyed that assignment. 
when the Italian theater closed, I was uh, sent back up to the German, to, to the European theater. Then I went home to the state, and somewhere along there I got major, and then I got lieutenant colonel. So I ended up with, as lieutenant colonel uh, on one of my trips. I, I, after that, I made two more trips to Germany. Uh, then when the Korean War broke out, actually I was shipped overseas to uh, Japan, the Repo Depot Siamid Artillery Battalion in Japan. Just at the end of the war, the prisoners all escaped in, in Korea. A lot of people didn't ever know that, but they, they, all, they, they were in camps there, Camp 9, Camp 8, and so forth. And I can't tell you exactly what happened. In fact, one of the uh, generals that got captured in that operation uh, put my mother and father up during my wedding. But the, uh, the prisoners all got out of the camp and they were afraid the prisoners were going to organize and be a problem. So overnight, my wife was due into Tokyo in four days and uh, they woke us all up and said, tomorrow we're going to load ships and go to the whole artillery battalion battalion's going to go to Korea and we've got to go, we're going to load tomorrow morning because we got to go over there in case those prisoners rebel. What, and year, we, what year was that, Fred? I'm trying to say 52. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I uh, got over there and um, again I lucked out because um, uh, uh, I was with this artillery battalion, but of course I had a lot of, I had been uh, uh, aide to a generals and I had been assist, I had, a, I was secretary of the general staff in first army and I'd had a lot of good assignments. And so uh, they, they said they didn't think they'd need the artillery anymore. So, uh, the commanding general of the division artillery, the commanding general of the division, his assistant commander, chief of staff, artillery general, all got on a beaver, L, beaver, which is not a five, beaver's a, anyway, it's a beaver, you know it. And, and they went back to Japan to set, make arrangements uh, for the, us to go back and they hit the side of Mount Fuji. So the whole division staff were killed and uh, got a phone with my, my uh, battalion commander called me in, he says, they're trying to rebuild the division staff down in Pusan and they want you down there. So I went down there uh, to Pusan and I got the, they gave me the job as assistant division chief to the division chief of staff which was quite an honor and quite a lot of fun I was a major then and uh, uh, and and then I got down there and uh, had a little more authority then so I had been worried about my my wife's due into Tokyo and what are we going to do well it turned out that Devardi uh, executive officer also had a wife on that boat also was in camp nine the old the old camp nine all we had was dirt floors it was a it was a pow yeah. camp and so he came in the office and he says can you arrange a, a flight back for me back to japan to pick up my wife and so we got talking i said heck my wife's on the same ship well it also turned out they played bridge all day all the way over together so we called the air i called the air force and laid on a, a dc-3 or a old 47 and they picked us up in pusan and took us back over to sendai japan and we met our wives and that came out very nice and we did a tour and but I still had to do my Korean tour and so I told my wife I put her in a in a BOQ at Camp Young in Japan way up in the mountains and I hired two Japanese girls lovely girls 
One worked at the, they both had worked at the officers club and I knew them and they spoke beautiful English. So in, for almost nothing, I hired both of them as her gut body. Her, for her, and they had shipped my car over to her. So she had an out of middle, two little children. And uh, the Japanese girls took care of her. So, and I had to finish my whole tour of career. Uh, it was a seven months, I can't remember how many months, but it was seven or eight months, and then I went back to Japan. And uh, I've had some real interesting... Uh, were, you, were you discharged after that hitch then? Or did you retire after that hitch? No, I went back to Germany again and, and uh, had some real wild experiences in Germany and... Uh, and uh, took my wife with me and got we got back well after when when I was in Italy I told you I met her in Italy mm -hmm. well what happened in Italy uh, it was time the theater was closing so her father was G1 and he was going home and her mother didn't want her well we never discussed getting married but her mother said if you want to marry my daughter, you'll have to do it in the States. So I went to Germany and she went home. And it took quite a lot of doing, but uh, I finally finagled uh, uh, a leave out of my command in uh, Germany. And I went back to camp, uh, back, back home and married her at Fort Governor's Island, New York. And uh, then I, the question was how to get back to Germany. Well, her father again, and, and I knew so many generals that I'd met in Italy. They arranged for me to go back on, uh, I think it was the SS Johnson. We got a private room, state room. <coughs> A little water in that glass right there. Let me get, let me get no, that, that left over from somebody else. Well, we went. Go ahead. We went back to Germany, and when I got to Germany, they said, "Well, there's no quarters available for you in Germany because uh, you 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 don't have any priority, and you're low on the list." So uh, thank you. So I said. Uh, turned out the camp commander of the camp my artillery battalion was in was the old IG from Italy. So I just went over to see him and he said, well, it was great to see you again. I said, I need a favor. And he said, what? I said, I got a wife outside and no house to live in. And he says, well, I have a beautiful house in my gardens for the caretaker and it's not being used. So you're, you're more than welcome to that. So my, that's how we got quarters over there. And we did that tour and then we came home and I was, uh, I was with the, got back to San Antonio, Texas. And then I was uh, four years, luckily that was the longest tour I ever had in my life, one place. I was advisor to uh, Army Reserve for four years in San Antonio, then went back to Germany again and had a very nice tour and some interesting assignments and uh, the last assignments, winter maneuver over there. And then that winter maneuver, the snow got deep and it got cold. If you touched the artillery piece, you didn't let go of it. You, it was rough, and I was logistics, so it was my job uh, to see that there was enough gasoline and fuel and ammunition for the mission, and all that, the trucks getting stuck and all that snow, and then living in a tent in that six foot of snow, it was one of the coldest winters they'd ever had. When I came back from Germany, I told my wife, well, I've got 22 years and go back to San Antonio. I said, I'm just too arthritic to spend another winter in the army in that snow and that cold. Uh, so I said, I just want to retire. So I retired in, uh, I believe it was 63. 
at Fort Sam Houston, Texas as Lieutenant Colonel. And uh, very thankful I had a good tour and enjoyed it. Well, what would you suggest to young men coming up today about life in the military? Well, I would, I would very strongly recommend it. Uh, we have, we're going through a little problem right now uh, in that uh, we have finally put girls or females into the service. And of course, the, the thinking in the Army, I'm an Army man, but the thinking that all of us thought, well, it was hard to swallow they were going to put the girls in there, uh, but everybody said, well, they won't be in harm's way. Well, it, the first thing that happened, the first two girls, who, which they thought were in, were not in harm's way, they were exactly what happened, you see. And, uh, and, and what struck me was this one girl uh, from Virginia, when she said, I joined she didn't say, but her family said. She joined the military to go to, to qualify for college. And uh, that must really kind of hurt the recruiting office a little because it brings home some, the, the, the wicked realization of what can happen if you enlist. But I would recommend anybody enlist and uh, you know, you got to be a fatalist, I think, in a way. Uh, what, 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 what is going to happen is going to happen to you. Uh, and you'll come out of the experience. I think some of the richest people in the world are military people. I mean, you look what's going on downstairs right here with this cogent few. The, the camaraderie, the the feeling that's generated. There's nothing like it in Branson. There's no other convention comes here that can touch it. Maybe some religious conventions, but if you go to a convention here of a religious organization, they're all tied together by a common denominator uh, of one goal, but they don't have the inter feeling that the military people have and any soldier anybody you talk to who's had military experience won't knock it they'll just say it's it really did me a world of good a world of good I I would strongly recommend it for young people and uh, if they get away if, if they can do their time I used to have to when I was with the Army Reserve, they came out with a program called uh, two and six, or a, an eight-year obligation. You signed up for an eight-year obligation, and you could do two years active duty and uh, six in the reserve. I signed up the, the whole baseball team at the Farm League in San Antonio, <laughs> but I've never had one of those boys come back and say that he was sorry they've said is that two years did them change their whole outlook on life I, I think it's I'd strongly recommend it you think a, a uniform draft would be for every young man I like had it had to be had to yeah had but to not be. necessarily I think that all Young men should have to register, and they, they're supposed to now, but that's a joke. They're, half of them aren't doing it, and there's no teeth in it. But in Switzerland, they have a compulsory, and uh, they call you up on, as a weekend soldier and train you and give you a rifle and ammunition, and you put it in the closet at your house. And if there's problem, they have a problem in Switzerland, every man is obligated and trained to just come out and they've got an instant military force in that town because they have their rifles at home and they're all trained to use them. And I think that we should call, every young man should have about six months of basic training 
in the use of firearms, in the use of, uh, uh, of, of, dis of, of appreciation of discipline. I think one of the greatest things that ever happened to the U.S. back uh, years ago was the CCC. I never heard a lad that was in it that didn't appreciate it. And we travel in our motorhome so much, and we're seeing so many beautiful things built by the CCC. Beautiful national parks. We owe so much of our national park beauty to CCC. And uh, those men learned discipline, they learned hardships, and they learned, I, I, have, I don't want to say they learned a skill because some of them did some people. For instance, I also, after I retired from the military, I got a job in San Antonio, Texas, with the state of Texas, uh, and really the Department of Labor. And I was an office manager uh, of a big office in San Antonio for uh, employment office. But in my travels with the de the uh, Department of Labor, I was one of the first pre people to work with Job Corps, which was similar to CCC. And I I, I was trying to uh, one of my jobs was to uh, try to be sure that when they completed their Job Corps obligation. That they that I was to help them integrate back into society, and uh, I remember uh, I got uh, I used to get shipment of these Mexican American lads from San Antonio. We have so many there, and they had taught them the art of selecting fence posts. We had sent them to a to a, what we call, we had urban camps and rural camps and they'd send to these rural camps and wh what they had them doing out there was building uh, fences for the western farmers and they were they would give them a, a, an MOS or a, a skill of selecting and building fences well there was no way there's no need of that in San Antonio and I was supposed to get these guys a job and teach them and I'd call one of these employers and tell them well he's got a whole six months experience in building barbed wire fence and they'd say well so what <laughs> but uh, the the Job Corps like CC uh, the job, job Corps never did uh, accomplish the work to CC for some reason no I think that uh, it's a, it's a good basic, but I think they ought to have six months of disciplinary training and uh, and hardships and learning to get along with other people. Yeah. And maybe we wouldn't have the just like it was. It's so disheartening for a military people to see those uh, uh, demonstrations yeah. in the city. Yeah. Uh, uh, we, that's fine, have your demonstration and your freedom of speech, but once we're committed to a thing, then I feel they should have soft-pedaled that a little. But we, we, we went some pretty hard times back when the, in the Beatnik days, and I wondered where we, and we got through them somehow, we'll get through this. Yeah. Well, it's been nice talking to you. Is there anything else that you can think of? No, I didn't. I didn't have any notes. I, I. Uh, this is kind of. But my daughter's been trying to get me to, to put some ideas down on. She says you'll be gone. I'm 80. In uh, June, I'll be 83. And I suppose. As I read the daily obituaries, I don't have a lot of time left to put down those ideas on tape. So I saw I appreciate you all giving me this opportunity to do this. Well, we thank you for doing it with us. And we, it's been it's been a, a joy just visiting with you and getting yeah, to know you a little well, bit. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate it. Good, man. <laughs>